You're listening to Canada Reads American Style, the only podcast by two librarians from Michigan who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our hosts, tech guru, baker, and historical romance reader Shauna, and content provider, dog lover, and nonfiction and realistic fiction reader Rebecca. Hello, and welcome to Canada Reads American Style. I'm Shauna. And I'm Rebecca. And we are very happy to have a return guest with us today, author Marcello Di Cintio, who was with us actually in January of this year to talk about his book, Pay No Heed to the Rockets. And with the recent events in Palestine, I want to highly encourage you to read that book. It is an incredible read. It's beautiful. It has so much information that is absolutely apropos to what's happening now. So I highly recommend that. But today we will be chatting about his current book titled Driven, The Secret Life of Taxi Drivers, which, by the way, has an incredibly gorgeous cover. Make sure and pick up a copy. Welcome, Marcello. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. We are thrilled to have you back. So we're going to get jump right into this because uh, I have a few questions that I cannot wait to hear your responses to. But the first one is that I believe this is your fifth book. Yes. And you're... Yeah, and your subjects are always unique and fascinating, and I really, truly wonder when and how did you come up with the idea to write this book? I can't imagine how, because there are really a wide variety of topics that you that you write about, so how did this one come to, to be? Well, this, is a, this was a unique one, because uh, at, at, at the very beginning, it was a commission book. My publisher uh, at Biblio Oasis, who, I, who I've never worked with before, so Dan Wells, you know, contacted me. He had read Pay No Heed to the Rockets, which you mentioned, and enjoyed it, and was looking for writers to cover, you know, Canadian topics. And all he, all, so he called me up and asked me if I wanted to write about Canadian taxi drivers. Or actually, he didn't even say, he didn't even say Canadian, taxi drivers. So it, it, was, it was like a two-word, you know, topic. And so I ran with it, and, and I was very excited about that, about the idea. Now, we didn't have an the idea at the beginning what this book was going to be about really we just we just had we just knew it was going to be about cabbies and so as someone who's who's written four other books as you mentioned all of which involved me traveling you know to distant places and to find stories in you know in western africa and the middle east and, and, and these kind of faraway places i was I, I started to wonder what stories i was missing in the backseat of the taxis you know what stories were i missing to and from the airports that i went on these on those long journeys so i decided to spend about a year a little more than a year traveling around canada meeting with drivers uh all around the country and getting to, getting a sense of, of of who they were where they came from what were their life stories um and it turned out i didn't <laughs> i didn't have to travel very far to hear amazing life stories as you can imagine and i and, and instead of leaving the country for a change Physically, I left the country through the life, the lives of these men and women, right? And th through their stories, I visited Sierra Leone and, uh, you know, World War II era Hungary and Iraq during the Gulf War and uh, behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia. And so my traveling was th was through space and time, but only through the stories of these men and women. How did you find them? I guess this, all of your subjects, because you are you're across all of Canada and they have such diverse stories. So how in the world did you look at all of them? You know, at first, my first idea was I'll, I'll, I'll go to the big cities and I'll go to the big city taxi companies and, and contact their, the managers there and, and say, are, are there any drivers that you know within your, the work for your, the drive for your company that have some amazing backstories? And that was a very, very poor way of doing it. Uh, the fact is that these these companies they're a little sometimes they're a bit media wary. Um, also, these these men and women in the space, the mostly men, are are they're busy. You know, they, they don't have time to be doing this you know, this sort of thing. And, and not, nor is there much value for them to spend an hour or two with some guy who's going to ask them about their lives. Right? These these are these are people working long hours to you know to feed their families. So what ended up happening more often than not, it was it was always through it was like through third parties. So I cast out on social media, like who knows cabbies with interesting stories, 
And oh, it was, you know, someone knew someone whose uncle drove cab or, or someone had heard of this guy or, that had a great story or someone was in the back seat of a cab and he got his card and who, who, had, who, had a, who had a fascinating story to tell. So that's how almost all the cabs were found that way. It was kind of following leads, you know, sending out messages, getting phone numbers and, and, uh, and finding these drivers that way. And I never talked to them as a passenger. I felt that would be, first of all, extraordinarily expensive to be traveling on the meter uh, for hours at a time. But also, I didn't want us to have a, you know, a, a customer driver relationship, right? I wanted, I wanted us to sit down in a place where they were comfortable, whether it was at their home or often at the, at the Tim Hortons coffee shops where uh, cabbies seem to frequent all around Canada. And just so I can get more of a personal conversation with them that did not, you know, that did not involve them driving me somewhere and collecting my money at the end of the trip. You know, and I want to go back uh, because at the beginning of the book, you mentioned what this book would not be with regard to what's been written about in the past. Can you mention those things? Because I thought that was really interesting too. In fact, I told someone, I showed them the copy of the book and I said, oh, I'm reading this. It's really great. And they went, oh, wow, the stories they must tell. And I said, no, no, no. That's just exactly what the book isn't about is some of those things that happened, but I'll let you explain what you, what you didn't want the book to be. Yeah. You know, just, as I said before, the book started off with just this idea of a book about taxi drivers. And I, and I didn't really know what I wanted the book to be when I started off, but I knew what I didn't want. And there was two kind of cliches that I wanted to avoid. And the first was what I call like taxi noir, the sort of sex, drugs, and misbehavior that goes on in the backseat of a cab during, you know, on those late night, those late night shifts, that kind of stuff, right? And I felt that that's the kind of thing, those are the kind of stories we've heard before, or at least we think that we know, right? This is the taxi cab of popular culture. This is the taxi cab of De Niro and Taxi Driver. You know, and I, and I thought that these are, you know, this is not, this is nothing new. We know these stories. And and when I was when I was meeting with these drivers, sometimes this what they assumed that I wanted to hear about. You know, when I would sit with these guys and they'd be like, "Oh, well, there was this one, this this one amazing time with this couple in the back seat." And I was like, "No, no, no, I'm not interested in those in those kind of you know ribald you know you know taxi noir stories. I want to hear more about your personal your, your personal life." And the other cliche that I wanted to avoid is the idea of what I call the the cabbie cardiologist, the idea of uh, the taxi driver who is uh, a professional somewhere far away. Uh, he's a doctor or an engineer or a pharmacist or an optometrist. And his credentials are not recognized in Canada. Therefore, he's driving taxi. So these overeducated drivers that are driving cab because they're not recognized uh, for their educations. And again, this is a story that I think we've all heard before. It's a story that, that we kind of know. And it's 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 a cliche too. And And what... <laughs> And how would those stories be different from each other anyway? You know, other than this guy was a cardiologist in Bangladesh and this guy was an engineer in Iran and neither of them are that anymore because they're driving cabs in Toronto or Montreal or whatever. So I didn't feel there was, there was that, the depth of the story there would be, would be that interesting. And I was happy in the end, right? I found very few of those cab, cabbie cardiologists anyway. Instead, I found men and women with fascinating, surprising stories. The kind of things that I never would have imagined, the stories I never would have imagined hearing. And I was so grateful uh, uh, for those drivers who, who shared those with me. And I found that there's, there's, you know, there's two kinds of driver. There's the driver who does not want to talk about themselves and the driver that they won't stop talking about themselves. And so I was very fortunate to meet a lot of the latter category. And, and, and yeah, I'm, yeah, very grateful to all those guys. Yeah, and I that's what I think what I loved about the book is that I love that you sort of said right up front what you didn't want it to be and I think what it be, what it what it is is a lot of compelling stories about people you know I was thinking about this I've hardly been in cabs in my life but I remember I was in a cab in Toronto Oh, a couple of years ago now. And it is funny how I thought to myself after I read the book, I thought, wow, I wonder what his story is. You know, it just, it makes you kind of interested. And it's interesting because you said something towards the end, I think about, you know, we don't think about who our barista is. We don't think about who this person is or whatever, but there is something about the intimacy of sitting in a car with someone who then you kind of do wonder, like, cause it's kind of a, you know, you're with a stranger, but you do kind of wonder what their story is. So I think you masterfully did this 
and told the stories that that are really amazing that we would be interested in, in reading. So thank you for that. Now, here's what I didn't know, because again, I've spent most of my life either driving a car, driving my car or riding public transportation, which I love, by the way. So I've very seldom been in cabs. But here's the thing that fascinated me was this, the part about the value of a taxi plate. So I wanted to, wondered if you could talk a little bit about how those plates worked and then the impact of Uber on these old school taxi drivers, because the two now are sadly intertwined. And I was the fact of the plates being seen as a pension tool, basically, like that was fascinating to me. Yeah, every city is slightly different. You know, not all the big cities have their taxi you know, industries work exactly the same way. But in a, in a lot of in a lot of big cities, uh, your taxi plate or your license or your medallion, it's called in, the, in, the, in New York has a market value. And so you purchase it for X amount. And then the assumption is that when you're when you're done, when you want to retire from driving, you then resell that permit medallion plate, whatever it is, for a profit. And in places like Toronto and Montreal, that system there is ex, you know it, it, they're explicit about that. They say, you know, when they hand you your your license or your permit, they say this is your pension. You know, you know, so when, when you're all done, you're going to turn this, you're going to turn this in and it's going to be worth a lot of money. You know, there's a guy in Montreal that I talk about, Hassan. He bought his permit or his plate for $160,000 in 2003. And it, it hits, it, it ended up being worth almost $225,000 at one point. In Toronto, the permits were, re- were valued as high as $380,000. And so when you, you would purchase that permit for much, much less and then sell it at the end. Now, what has happened with Uber and these other app-based ride uh, uh, services is that is the value of those permits dropped because there were so many other drivers on the road that were not beholden to that same system that the, the value of, that, of those permits started to drop and drop and drop. And then in, play, and then in some places... In order to <laughs> to level the playing field, those the, the the permits the requirement for the permits were were eliminated altogether. This happened in Quebec. So, for example, Hassan, who I mentioned, who bought his permit for one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, saw it rate raise in value up to two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, and then Quebec comes in and says, "No one needs a permit anymore." Now that that permit is worth zero dollars, right? Because no one needs it anymore. So there's no value to it in Toronto. Like I said, the, the, the value of a Toronto uh, taxi permit went as high as $380,000. And around last December, the last time I looked, you could buy a, a permit on like Craigslist for less than $20,000. And it's probably even lower now. What happened, the industry, and it's, it's not just because, not just Uber as a company's fault. It's also the fault of the, of the municipal governments that allowed this to happen and, allow, and allowed the system to be totally disrupted and destroyed by this these new companies leave it to government to step in i know so i just want to tell people when you read this book i i don't know how many of us would have known that whole backstory of all of that so I, to me that was one of the most fascinating parts of this of your book is that whole explanation so thanks i i, I loved no, learning something completely new that you know i had no idea about and it made me it broke my heart because you know traditionally they could count on this and now it has no value. So it's like, oh, man. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not about competition either, right? Like, it's not about it, it, all the drivers I talked to. They said, no, we'll, we'll welcome competition. You know, this, you know, this, is, this is the system. What, what they're upset about is that the rules were different for the Uber and Lyfts of the world. They, what they swept in and were, and were not held to the same regulations. They were allowed to, to operate in a completely different way. And then this system was then destroyed. If everyone was working within the same rules, absolutely. You know, companies come and go, right? I mean, like every other business. Um, but this was not this was not fair what had happened to, to the cab industry. And a lot of these drivers, they don't see the traditional taxi industry surviving for more than another four or five years. They literally think that we're done with traditional cabs. Now, I'm not sure I believe that, but uh, it shows just kind of where these drivers believe they are. They're at the, they believe they're at the edge of the edge of the cliff. This is an existential uh, crisis that they're facing. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I kind of wondered about that because, you know, with these ride shares, Uber or other companies like that, and the fact that they didn't have, they weren't held to the same standards, although they are more now, but I just thought, you know, it's kind of, I hate to say this, but it's kind of like, you know, the white rhino died out and we'll never see it again. And you sort of look at certain industries and you think, you know, I'm from the Flint, Michigan area. So, you know, car companies, uh, you know, what, the way it used to be isn't the way it is now. I mean, things change and, and it is weird to be able to see something that has always been, part of our culture that it could, it could disappear. So yeah, I don't know. But now my, my next question is, I understand going to be similar to asking you who your favorite child is, <laughs> but the, of the many people that you interviewed for the book, whose story was the most compelling to you? And then when you're done, I'm going to tell you who mine was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, it should be, it should be harder for me to come up with my favorite, but there's a there's a place in my heart for Mo Jaleel from Halifax. Mo is this big, big bruising former wrestling champion, Iraqi soldier, right? Who fought two wars for Saddam Hussein. You know, he fought against the Iranians and he fought against the Americans in the first Gulf War. And I say this with affection. You know, Mo is an arrogant guy. He he describes himself as a peacock. And he's always been a bully. Like he's always been the biggest guy in the room. He's always been a bit of a bully, even when, when he was a kid. He got in trouble in the <laughs> in the military for like beating up a superior officer, and ended up doing two years. Or I forget what the sentence was. He ended up in in a, in a military prison. Uh, I think it was for two years. And uh, and but but there's but the layers of that guy are so fascinating right he's this bruising bully of a man he also wanted to be an artist you know he he eventually his first thing he came to halifax uh, to do was to, he started art school that's what he he wanted to be a visual artist he um he brought with him terrible ptsd that triggers in him every now and again these violent episodes that he that he has difficult controlling he was married he got divorced he was driving uh a regular cab and then started driving around the elite of Halifax, these, these millionaires that he became sort of a sort of their their concierge and their driver and sometimes their babysitter. And uh, I've never met a guy who's kind of so self-aware of his own failings, right? If you talk to Mo, Mo knows he's kind of a jerk often. You know, Mo knows that he's a bully and that he's arrogant and that he's that he that he's self-centered and vain. Um, but that's <laughs> That self awareness makes all like it almost, you know, it, it makes me love him for those faults, right? I've never met anyone as self aware as Mo. I'm not, I'm not that self aware. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that admitting of my failings the way this guy is. And uh, and he's just, he's just this to me, he's just this darling character. And I have people read the book, and they've said to me, half of them say that Mo is their favorite driver, and others say that he's their least favorite. But they did. They didn't like him at all. He was just a big jerk, and I think that goes that points to what a layered and and fascinating and and interesting man Mo Jalil is. Yeah, I love the guy. Yeah, I have to say, as I was reading about Mo, I kept saying to myself, "It's almost fantastical." You just say to yourself, "Come on, is this guy legit?" You know, because his stories are so over the top. But you, but you did layer him really well because by the time I got to the end of his chapter, I said to myself, yeah, he's a real person. Like at the beginning, I was like, oh, it's all bluster. But you just presented him so beautifully and it's, I ended up liking him. So I'm not, a, I'm not in the camp of on the other side. I really liked him. You know, I was, I was worried about Mo a little bit because, you know, Mo, he's got, yeah, he, he's this big bruising guy. He's got a temper. My portrayal of him, I felt, was was it was warts and all, and I was curious what was going to happen once he read it. And as soon as he read it, he he sent me a text, and he was thrilled. He was thrilled. Oh. And so was his, so was his family and friends who read it. Like they were like, he was very happy that I portrayed him so honestly, and I was worried about that. You know, you know, I you know because he yeah, he, like I said, he doesn't come off. People do hate him when they read when they read his, his story. Um, but he was very, he was very pleased more than anyone else that I, that had got back to me. He was just over the moon over his portrayal, which I, which I was both kind of happy and relieved about. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I, no I don't want Mo yeah. Julia. I don't want Mo Julia as my enemy. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, I can I can totally understand that. That is so funny, but uh, I love that he loved his portrayal. So that is a testament to your brilliant writing. But I have to tell you the one that stuck out for me, and I have to say, I love them all because when I went back and looked at them individually and thought, okay, who's, who's kind of my favorite? I, well, maybe... I shouldn't say favorite, but more kind of compelling. And here's the one that really sort of touched my heart because I was just, I kind of felt bad, but Sergei, because he was one, he was the only one in the book who didn't want to be in Canada. And yet he made his life there. And I thought, what a story. Like I'm always going for the heartbreaking stories, right? And I, when I read his, I finished it and I thought, wow, you know, he's still, you know, and you painted that beautiful portrait as well, where he, when he thinks of home, it's not where he lives now. It's where he lived. Yeah. And, and it's a place that we were, we were raised to, to hate and or ridicule, right? Now, Sergei comes from the Soviet Union. You know, he was, he, he lived during the, you know, he was born and, and grew up during the Cold War. He fought for the Soviets in Afghanistan. And he talks about, you know, Soviet Russia, in the most glowing terms that, that, that strikes against everything that we were supposed to, that we learned growing up in the eighties. Right. I'm a child of the cold, of the, of the cold war. You know, that's, we were, we were taught to, 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 to hate the Russians and that their system was backwards. That it was, you know, it was all bread lines and, and, and all this stuff, but he talks with such love about his childhood in, 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 in the Soviet union and, and that Canada, you know, you know, we're 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 arrogant up here in Canada. You know, we, we we like to think that this is the greatest country in the world. We like to think that you know everyone's welcome here, and we, we you know we've got things figured out. But it's not a safe haven for everybody. Definitely not, and, and it's not a perfect place. It's not a paradise. You know, Sergey would much rather, I think, raise his children in the Soviet system, which doesn't even exist anymore, um, than than in in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is a beautiful, charming, warm, and welcoming place. But it's not, it's not the Soviet Union where, where, where doctors would come to your house uh, when your child was sick, where, where kids, where families didn't have to pay for anything, where they were put in sports for free and all this, all this sort of care that, uh, that, uh, that he had there. And he grew up thinking the opposite of us, right? He grew up thinking of Canada and the West as this cold, heartless place. There's still part of him that believes that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought his story was incredible. But I will say, I mean, I loved all their stories because they're each in their own way is just, they're unforgettable people. So it's just kind of amazing. Now, the next question I'm going to ask is kind of related to it, but I wondered, is there anyone you interviewed, and it may end up being Mo, but is there anyone you interviewed for the book whom you would want to hear from once a year for a progress report? <laughs> or after you've interviewed people, do you, are you able to just sort of be done with that? And then, because I would be crazy, like wanting to follow up and know how things played out like years later. So I'm just wondering, is that, does that ever strike you? Or is that something that's not part of your profession, kind of your professional life? Uh, you know, it, it, it hasn't been in the past. This, this book was unique in, in a, another way in that it was, the book was done pretty much. The, 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 the draft was finished and then the pandemic happened. And, and, uh, I felt I needed to go back and talk to these drivers, at least some of them, to find out how how their life had changed as drivers during the pandemic. So I did go back to talk to some of them, you know, it, as a, you know, in a in a professional way, right? To, to get a, to get follow up interviews, which is something that I w I've never had to do in, with my previous books. You know, I've never had to go back, and so I established in a way this ongoing relationship with some of these drivers. And, and which, you know, which, cause, cause I need, because I needed to. And now I do think about them a lot, you know, and, and, and their lives changed so much even between the last time I talked to them and then went back to do this pandemic postscript. And so I do wonder what they're up to, you know, like, uh, um, and, and, <laughs> and some of them call me, you know, you know, uh, uh, Hassan from Montreal is his, his call to see how I'm doing. Alex is such a talkative guy from from Edmonton, and and he every now and again will, will, will just will, will drop me a line. You know, uh, um, so you know, like I, I, just, I talked about Mo, how Mo's been. You know, he's such a he's so so pleased with with his portrayal in the book, and I've heard from him. So yeah, I, I, I'd love to ch check up on these guys. You know, half of them aren't aren't even driving anymore. You know, the the, the pandemic and, and other things kind of killed their business, and they're they're doing different things. Some of them, a lot of them. 
And so, yeah, I, I, have, a, I have this terrible habit in my writing there. I, I just, I, I kind of, I kind of fall in love with all my characters, you know, I, you know, I, and I, 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 I seem to never write about someone I don't like, <laughs> I don't like. And so, which is, which is not, which is not the best uh, uh, habit for a journalist, but I, I, these guys are, these guys and women are great. You know, and 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 I, I would love to if I ever return to play if I ever return to Halifax, I want to I want to see Mo. You know, and I want to hang I want to hang out with the Ikwe women in Winnipeg, and 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 uh, you know, you know, in Montreal, I'll go for coffee with Hassan. You know, I you know I hope so anyway. I I I, I and I and I and I and I think that they from the, for the most part, the ones that I've heard from anyway, they uh they've been they like how I portrayed them. And so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not their enemy if I, if I, if I show up. Yeah. Oh, that's good to hear because I think if I were, if I were a writer of nonfiction in this style, I think I would want to, I would want to know, and it would be loving, lovely to be able to ha- make those connections. And uh, I, I just think that's kind of cool. So I love that you may, you know, continue to be in touch with some of them. So that's cool. And I will from time to time check in with you on Mo because I'm sure <laughs> Mo Mo's story is not com- not finished yet. We know that. So <laughs> no, last I, I talked, you know, I talked to Mo just the other day, uh, just a few days ago, and he is uh, looking to get back into art, which I thought was interesting. So he's going to give that he's going to give art another shot, which is which is uh, I'm thrilled for him. I hope and I, 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 I wish him the best with that. That's awesome. All right. Now, my favorite quote in the book is in the epilogue in which you write, I'd set out to find storytellers. Instead, I found problem solvers. I envied their practical intelligence. And I wondered if your original outline, did it match your final draft or did the interviews take you in an unexpected direction? Outline, you say. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Well, you know, as, as, you know, as I as I said at, at the beginning, that there was there was not this was a rare book in that I did not have a, um, you know, a, 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 this book was not outlined bef- before before I started it, so I didn't even I didn't know what I wanted to find. I think there is there was a difference though what between my, me and my publisher. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and I and I mean this with, with utter respect. I mean, Dan at Biblio Oasis is amazing. Uh, he, he's an amazing editor, uh, but I think. Well, I know that the book I delivered was not the book he expected, and I think he he was he thought the book would be more about the business, the taxi business, you know, uh, more along what what's it like to to drive cab, and I was far more interested in in, in the drivers, not the driving, and uh, uh, and so what what was expected to be a more a more business centered book became far more of a you know, a life story profile biography centered, centered, centered book. But when it gets to the end of what you're, t- what you're asking me about, you know, I, 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 I suspected I would find drivers with, with wonderful stories. You know, I, I was, I was surprised by how, how multi-layered and, 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 and amazing the stories were, but I, I, I suspected that, that, that those people behind the wheel had, had, had been through, had, had lived a life. And I, I knew I would find men and women who worked exceptionally hard. And I think, and I think we can all can imagine that. I think we can all imagine drive our, our cabbies putting long hours behind the wheel and dealing with, you know, dealing with drunks and bigots and and all kinds of, you know, the, kind of the, the the worst of society that they have to endure, you know, as as part of that job. But what struck me the most, and what they all seem to have in common, was they're all kind of geniuses in their own way. You know, all all of these men and women had. Had whatever challenges they faced in their life, and whether it's whether it's something like war or or just or just feeding their families, they all they all broke the rules they needed to break. They all kind of figured out a plan. They all were these kind of chess masters of their own life. We talk about Mo again. We you know here's a guy who was who was uh, who was court martialed for uh, for assaulting a, a superior officer, like I mentioned. And for a long time, evaded prosecution by getting a death job in the military and shuffling around his papers and reassigning him places and hiding these these reports so that, you know, they, they, they weren't able to track him down. You know, and, and you, you got people like Jas and Amrit in Calgary, this couple, like the, the taxi driving couple who somehow managed through incredible hard work. Uh, cobble together this this life for themselves and 
and their family through through a series of low paying jobs. You know, they go from you know chambermaids to, to delivering pizza, but they realize that this other pizza place is more make they can make earn a little bit more money delivering for them. So they switch jobs and then they move to an even better pizza job. And this just just kind of you know figuring the system out. All of them, all you know, uh, Michael in Sierra Leone, who lost his leg, you know, in the in the in the war, you know, manages to, to build himself a life out of this refugee camp. You know, opens up a tailoring shop, manages to to, to navigate the um the immigration papers to get to Canada, helps start an amputee soccer team, and 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 competes internationally with this team that he helped to found. I mean, these. These men and women are, are they're brilliant. They have this, like I said, this, this practical intelligence that we don't see or recognize, you know, just staring at their, at their eyes in the rearview mirror, right? You know, there's, there's, there's some big thinkers that are behind the wheel. And I don't mean that they're just doctors from Bangladesh. No, they're people who, who've managed to just figure stuff out. And I envied, I envied their intelligence. You just touched on so many of the things that I was thinking about too an incredible work ethic to where, and, and it was almost like, you know, they could be, they could have been down so many times, but they were so resilient. And, but I don't even know that they would even see it that way. It's just that they, like you say, they carved it out for themselves through their, you know, hard work, grit, intelligence, figuring out the system there. That's why I say each person's story was really fascinating. And, and I just, yeah, I just want to highly recommend if, if people haven't figured this out by now, I absolutely love the book. I can't wait uh, to put it because I'm going to add my collection, my book into our library collection here in, in Michigan. I cannot wait till people get their hands on it because it, it's really a great read. You know, it's a quick read because it's so interesting. You can't put it down. So I just want to highly, highly encourage everybody to pick up, uh, pay no heed to the rockets, pick up this one and just pick up everything that you write because I just think you're a fabulous writer. So sorry, I'm, I'm I know sometimes I sometimes I gush, but it is what it is. I accept it. <laughs> My final question for you, and this might be a horrible thing to ask, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, because you're on tour with you know this book. Do you have something planned for the future? And not not that you have to necessarily tell us anything, but I just wonder like how long do you are you constantly working on sort of the next thing or how does that work and what's next? You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm literally not hundred percent sure right now. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about, about migrant workers in Canada, you know, a, a similar, a similar type of, of book to this, you know, to, to, to focus on the lives of, of these people, you know, who, people who come, come to, to my country, but we don't let them stay. You know, we, we let them work. We don't let them stay. And, and and I think there's I think there's some amazing stories that probably can be found in there. Yes, I'm sure the United States has 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 these has these workers as well. I am though looking for, and I, I say this after every book, and, and and it doesn't last very long. But you know, when when I'm writing a book, all I want to do is write for magazines, and when I'm writing for magazines, all I want to do is start a new book. So I I I really like the idea of 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 magazine writing right now, where I can get obsessed with a topic just for a month. Or three weeks, you know, and 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 you know, pound out two thousand, three thousand words, and then move on to the next thing. I, that that right currently, that feels really good right now. That all said, who knows? By the by, the fall, I might be on another big, another big project, which is just fine too. Okay, well, here's the book I told Shauna after I read the book. I told Shauna, here's what I think your next your next subject will be, right? Because one of the chapters in the book was just incredible. And I think, and I think you may have written articles about it, to be honest with you, I'm not sure, but I think your book should be about sex workers. Because I think her story, when I read her story, and I'm trying to remember what her Tammy, Tammy Marie. Okay. I, you know, I thought that was an incredible story. And I love that, it, that she's not a cab driver. She's someone who depends on cab drivers and, or, or did. And so her story Oh my gosh, it was incredible. So I just sort of feel like I agree with you about the migrant workers too, though, because obviously in the United States and I lived in California for 30 years, we exploit our, our migrant workers and we, you know, we do terrible things uh, when they work so hard to provide uh, in California, especially, you know, food to the, to the world and to the, this country. I love that. And I'll, I'll absolutely read that book, but I think 
What do you think? I think sex work. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. You know, that, that was, that, that, that's been an idea of mine for a long time. Um, in fact, I, I pitched the idea of writing a, a book about sex workers al- already. There is, there is a, a, an idea though, and I, and I have to be sensitive to it. You know, I'm some, I'm some white middle-aged guy, you know, or, you know, and, and writing about, writing about sex workers. These are, these are stories that are not mine to tell in a lot of ways. And I, and I feel, I feel that tension a little bit, even when I was writing about Tammy Marie and like, and, and I have written a, a, a couple of magazine stories over the past year about, about sex workers. It is a, it is a, it is a kind of a topic and, and, a, and, a, and, and an industry that really, really fascinates me. And I, and uh, I, I have, I, it's, it's certainly on the brain. There will be, if I do a, a migrant worker book, there will be a chapter on, 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 on sex workers in that as well. But I'm glad you said that. Maybe I'll pass, I'll pass it on to my, uh, to my publishers and maybe they'll, maybe they'll, 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 uh, they'll, they'll let me do it. But it, it is a, it is a, it's a fascinating uh, topic for sure. Yeah, Tammy Marie's story is amazing, and and some of the workers that I've I've written about here in Calgary are just remarkable, uh, remarkable people, and and uh, and who, I'd love I'd love to I'd love to you know spend some time with them hearing their stories too. Well, Marcello, thank you again for meeting with us. We are so thrilled to have you. Oh, such a pleasure. And whatever you do in the future, we hope you'll always yeah we hope you'll always come back and chat with us. Thank you so much. I will. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and tell all your friends about Canada Reads American Style. Bye.